Welcome to our webcast, Vibration Monitoring Solutions for Hydropower Plants. I'm Elizabeth Ingram, Senior Content Director for Clarion Energy's HydroReview website and our HydroVision International event. This webcast is produced by HydroReview and HydroVision International and is sponsored by PCB Piezotronics. Before we get to the content of this webcast, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items with you. The presentation is live. You can ask a question at any time by typing your question into the question box. You should use that question box for any technical difficulties you are experiencing as well. We recommend that you close down any other applications you have open at this time on your computer so that you can avoid any technical issues and fully concentrate on the discussion that you're about to hear. Finally, for your convenience, this presentation is available and it is in the resources section and you can also find it on the webcast section at hydroreview.com after the webcast. And now let's get started with our webcast on vibration monitoring solutions for hydropower plants. Vibration monitoring for hydroelectric generators is a very important technology to help prevent catastrophic failures. PCB, piezotronics, and IMI sensors provide customers with several different options for properly monitoring a hydro machine. These options include some very low cost solutions that can fall within almost any budget. This webinar will start with some basics of a hydropower plant and further discuss the options available to help keep your plants running effectively without any unplanned disruptive <clears throat> So now I'd like to turn this over to our primary speaker for this webcast, who is Dave Martin. Dave, thanks so much. Thank you for the introduction, Elizabeth. Good morning, everybody, and or good afternoon or evening, wherever you may be. Thank you for uh, joining us today to talk a little bit about um, vibration monitoring solutions for hydropower plants. Now we're back again, sorry about that. <laughs> I wanted to talk a little bit, started and talk about PCB. Uh, I'm hoping um, many, many of uh, the audience knows who we are. Um, we're in a, used to be a family owned company up until the last uh, seven or eight years ago. Um, we're PCB Piezotronics and founded in 1967. Um, where our headquarters is we're just outside of Buffalo, New York. Um, and we have offices throughout the world, um, direct offices. Uh, where we don't have a direct, direct office, we'll have a, a distribution of company of some kind. Um, we're, we're a very, very uh, vertically integrated company uh, where we go at, do everything from our machining to final assembly. In one of our facilities, whether it's um, in New York, uh, North Carolina, uh, where most of our manufacturing is done and we do buy some things in from other other places but for the most part everything is done either in New York or North Carolina. Um, and Devco was a company another vibration monitoring company we acquired a couple of years ago they were added into us they're kind of still a standalone company under PCB um, but you know we 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 are um, combined with them and also uh, we have, we were acquired by Amphenol, um, the big company of Amphenol, which you probably heard of um, earlier this year. So we're in the middle of an integration um, with them today. We're probably the world leader in uh, sensors for industrial, power gen, aerospace and defense and automotive industries. And we do a lot of high temperature stuff for um, major OEM uh, customers, uh, accelerometers, uh, pressure sensors, and, and more. And slide one, advance again. Yeah, I'm in trouble advancing the slides, and I'm not sure why. So, there, uh, a little bit about myself. I've, I've worked for PCB for uh, about five years now. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer. I, my entire uh, past 25 plus years, I've focused in the energy market and power generation. A lot of hydro focus on hydropower and gas turbines as well. Um, prior to focusing on on energy and power generation, I did a lot of industrial work in general, pulp and paper, um, steel, general general industrial things, manufacturing. 
uh, my position at PCB um, since I started. I'm, I'm a business development manager, so I, in this role, I, I help find us new new customers and also I support our our sales uh, directly in in my markets, which is energy. So and that's that's pretty much uh, you know globally has you know our our sales networks and these help um, I, I help them wherever it may may take me. Um, I've been a category three vibration analyst for many, many years. So I, I, you know, I don't practice it daily, so I, I don't call myself an expert in vibration, but I'm probably pretty, pretty good still. Um, I've been on the API 670 committee for you know, over 10 years. And that committee, if you're not familiar with it, focuses on, on vibration uh, requirements, in, mainly in uh, the oil and gas or refining industry. Um, also speaking with me today will be Dale Campbell with Grant, Grant County Public Utility District. And Dale, if you want to talk about yourself. Good morning. Thanks for this uh, opportunity, Dave and uh, Clarion. Uh, a little bit about myself. I'm uh, fortunate to be able to work for an owner operator in uh, the great state of Washington on the Columbia River. Uh, Grant County PD has uh, two hydroelectric facilities on the Columbia River, roughly a thousand megawatts each. And uh, in eastern Washington, uh, we do have two small hydro facilities uh, also on, uh, well, on irrigation systems, not also on irrigation systems. I'm a mechanical engineer as well. Um, been in several different roles at Grant County from plant engineering to uh, plant O&M leadership with uh, operation and maintenance and uh, current role is uh, senior manager of power production engineering and uh, graduate of uh, Washington State University. Go Cougs, if you're a, a Cougar fan. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Dave. Thanks. Thanks, Dale. Appreciate it. Go Cougs. So, um, yeah, PCB, we the number of years we've been in business, we, we, we've we uh, worked in all different types of power generation and, and us, along with a lot of our sister companies, um, we, we can do um, combustion dynamics, industrial hygiene, um, tank gauging, um, ground fault detection. So all of our companies will have a little bit of something for within the power generation and um, most of our other companies are also somewhat in the, into the hydro um, market as well. We've got a lot of uh, products for, you know, vibration monitoring, hydro, a lot of slow speed styles of sensors and other devices that help monitor vibration within the hydro market. So what I'm going to talk about, and you know, some of this is brief, and I, apologies in advance if it's basic for some. Um, it kind of talks about, you know, the world in hydro and how a hydro power plant works. I'm just going to be all brief stuff. Um, a little bit on, on operations, um, some of the solutions we offer for hydro, and, and then Dale's going to speak on a case study at Grant County, um, and then depending on our timing, we might get into our, some of our sister company's products. We have a few slides, that we can go over those briefly. So um, I, I did a similar presentation several months ago as, as this to another group, um, and then you know, renewable power is what we call is in right now. I mean, you see you see stuff going up all over the you know country. You know, the last year and a half, I haven't traveled really outside of the U.S., but you know, just traveling within the U.S. Uh, since COVID and everything, is, I see a lot of um, you know wind energy going up still, a lot of solar facilities, and some um, battery storage plants seem to be getting a lot of traction. I, I Toured one of those a couple of years ago out in California. It was pretty pretty interesting. They turned a gas turbine plant into a battery storage uh, plant, and it was kind of interesting to me what they were doing with that and how much they were. You know, basically, it was a 25 megawatt uh, power plant to run off of, off of batteries that they they capture the the power when it's uh, when it's cheap. They charge batteries when power is uh, cheap to buy off the market, and then they sell it off the batteries when it's expensive. So that's how they make their money. And, Seem to be, you know, very profitable from the, for them is from what I could see. Um, 
I've been to probably a good part of the hydro plants around the United States and Latin America over my time. Uh, so I'm very familiar with a lot of those. Um, and we like to say, we say um, that nuclear and coal power is slowly declining. Uh, it's slowly declining. Um, I think we still see that today. You know, how much further it'll decline, you know, is an unknown to me. Um, I do still see a lot of new gas turbine power plants uh, being built um, today all over, you know, North America and South America, especially. Um, so I don't, I don't think those are going to go away anywhere anytime soon. So um, why, why are we um, f focus on hydro? Is it generally, you know, hydro is a focus market for PCB. Um, and, you know, the main reason is because renew en renewable energy is a current trend. Um, older, older hydro plants are running more often, more often than they used to um, back before renewable energy was a trend. Um, a lot of the older plants built many, many years ago didn't have any type of vibration monitoring on them. A lot of small hydro units uh, couldn't really afford a full-blown vibration monitoring system. They were looking at ways to monitor these really these smaller uh, turbines um, in a cost-effective way. Uh, they come to us asking what we could possibly do to help them to avoid a catastrophic failure. And we actually have products for that. Um, we, we have a program within PCB called the Total Customer Satisfaction or TCS, where you know we, we help solve customers to solve problems and find the right products and we guarantee um, uh, what we sell to work for their applications. We have a lot of uh, experience in-house for these types of applications. A few, few slides on the, on the world. Um, of course, probably a lot of you are familiar with Three Gorges is the largest uh, um, hydro power plant in the world, which has a uh, 22.5 gigawatts of capacity. Um, in in uh, Washington State, that's the largest U.S.-based uh, hydropower plant. It's got 6.8 gigawatts of uh, generating capacity there. I've been to this plant um, a few times. It's a big, massive plant. Lots of stuff going on there, um, and they're they're watching their their vibration. Um, consistently there and constantly. So they know when something's going to happen so they can shut their, their big units down. A little breakdown on the largest uh, US-based uh, hydro plants. Um, I won't read all these off, but you can see see on the, on the list of where they are and who they are and where. Um. So uh, the types of power plants, there's, there's, you know, basically what I call four, four types of hydropower plants. There's the watersheds and dams where, you know, the water's up in a dam and it's released at certain times and certain levels to produce power as it spins, it's gonna spin the turbine. Um, there's uh, projects that, that use the flow of the river uh, to spin a turbine and generate power. Um, there's offshore hydropower, which is, is a little newer um, for, for creating power. Um, in the hydro world, it's just using uh, tidal wave currents, and um, this uh, device just moves with the waves to, in order to generate, turn a generator and make power. Um, pump storage facilities is another is another uh, type of power plant, which we'll talk a little bit more about. But there's there's a lot of pump storage plants in the U.S. I think the U.S. is the largest uh, um, country, or I guess the country with the most number of pump storage hydropower plants but you know basically you know the way they work is they uh, on low demand hours they they run everything backwards and they fill up a reservoir above the plant they usually usually do that at night um, and they fill up the reservoir at night and when uh, power is uh, needed during the day and they get called to run they release that and generate the power from the water they um, pumped up there overnight so it's a real efficient, uh, efficient way. There, you know, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of issues with these plants, but for the most part, they're pretty sound. And uh, typically, these type of plants always have some kind of vibration monitoring on them to make sure they're, they're not uh, vibrating too much. Typical anatomy of, you know, 
let's just say hydropower plants that we all are real familiar with, you know, water water flows through a, a screen, debris filtered at the top, um, and then that filtered water runs through a big pipe called a penstock. Um, and then that water that comes out, the force spins a turbine at low speed, um, which which also spins a generator that produces a little electricity. Um, and where it's sent to a transformer to increase voltage and then it's sent out. Um, and then the water from there is, is run downstream into a river. So you know, just basic, uh, normal normal uh, hydropower plant there. That's what we have mostly in the world, that type of plant. Um, talking about different types of turbines, I'm gonna let Dale talk about this and I'll advance the slides. Dale? Okay, great. Hydro turbines fall into two main categories, uh, impulse and reaction turbines. Impulse turbines are for areas that uh, typically are higher head, higher velocity, and reaction turbines are usually uh, higher flow. And uh, so we'll talk a little bit more in the next slide about uh, sort of what those uh, different two main categories of uh, turbines uh, look like. So those uh, two categories uh, fall into primarily three types, and you see uh, pictures, graphics of those uh, three major types of hydro turbines. Kaplan turbines, I'll talk about first. Those are uh, primarily in areas with a lower head and higher flow. The blades pitch to achieve the maximum efficiency. Uh, those are the uh, the large turbines that we have, or Kaplan turbines. They, uh, on the Columbia River, most of them are, uh, except for uh, Grand Coulee and, and uh, a couple others. The Francis and Pelton turbines are typically higher head, or uh, you know, difference between the forebay and the tail race. Uh, Francis being the most common, and the Pelton being the uh, highest head or the greatest difference between forebay and tail race. Uh, as you see here, Pelton have uh, prone to more maintenance problems. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not as familiar with Peltons, but uh, they do run at uh, definitely higher speed, higher shaft speed than uh, Kaplan and Francis. There are some other turbines that are less common, uh, cross flow or kinetic turbines that you may see in uh, smaller uh, sizes, smaller stream flow uh, that are uh, worth noting as well. Thanks, Derek. They all appreciate it. Uh, so a, a typical um, hydro hydroelectric generator, it's a turbine. Um, the larger ones that I've seen, they they always have a sleep bearings, um, and the main the main bearings, the guide bearings, upper lower bearings have proximity probes mounted on the bearing housings, looking looking for a shaft vibration. Um, so those are those are really critical, especially since they're sleep bearings. You know. They, the best way to monitor a sleep bearing is by uh, with a proximity probe, and you know you can. There there are people out there that don't that, that think that you know proximity probes aren't always necessary, um, but for sleep bearings they are. You know, and I but I kind of am an old old Don Bentley fan, the guy that invented proximity probes. So you know I'm, I I always respected Don and his work for what he did at inventing the proximity probe. So I, I really think that's the best way to, to monitor sleep bearings um, but despite that you know if we're looking at these these, these uh, generators um, they all everyone I've seen that has uh, proximity probes also has accelerometers of some kind um, and these are these are used for looking at vibration on other parts of the uh, of the unit um, looking for absolute vibration casing vibration and you know Different different points on the machine that have problems is draft tube vibration, um, everything everything. I'll get in more talk about that in a little bit. Um, so you know, and the the next little bullet point down there talks 
talks about gates and bearings, draft tubes, ro rotor stators, um, different spots that are going to be monitored. And these 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 points are usually um, always done with accelerometers or velocity sensors. Um, larger larger uh, plants typically have other equipment aside from the turbine itself. Um, they have pumps and fans, other balance of plant equipment that are monitored with accelerometers. Um, and a lot of this equipment runs all the time, even when the turbines are, are shut down and not running. This balance of plant, plant equipment is still, still running. And you know most most plants that have this are monitoring it either online or or with a portable data collector where they go out there once a month or once a quarter and check the vibration and uh, trend trend the data. I'm turning it back over to Dale. I was going to talk a little bit about the duck curve and and what this what this really means. And this is kind of useful information, Dale. Yeah, thank you. So being in Washington State, uh, the duck curve is uh, frequently talked about when we look at the interconnection between uh, the West Coast and uh, specifically California, with uh, California having a lot of solar power and a lot of sunshine. It has uh, driven um, when power generation occurs. And this is a, a more recent change in uh, how wind power generation peaks with uh, solar power, as you would expect. Power generation is highest in the middle of the day. So uh, the noon time, the peak time when uh, solar power is the highest. Unfortunately, that corresponds to the lowest power demand. <clears throat> so the highest power demand typically occurs early in the morning uh, when everyone gets up and makes breakfast. And then in the evening when folks come home and, and turn on the TV or watch the movie. So the, the challenge is you have um, a mismatch between when the peak of power production occurs and when the peak demand occurs. And this is called the duck curve based on the, the shape of the, uh, the power demand, which sort of looks like a duck. Uh, the challenge, of course, is uh, if your solar power is your, your only method of generating, those don't match. So where hydro comes in is it has the ability to store energy store energy in the form of reservoirs. Certainly pump storage has the, the greatest capacity to do this, but uh, every, pretty much every hydro facility has some storage capacity. Uh, so what is done to help balance the demand and the generation is hydropower helps store that energy and produce it when uh, solar power is declining um, and help fill the gap. Uh, this is called load shaping is another term that the power marketing folks use, <clears throat> um, but it's definitely a benefit of uh, hydropower to be able to uh, provide this uh, shaping to help with the, uh, the mismatch. That's the duck curve. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Dale. Appreciate it. Looking uh, forward a little bit. Um, hydropower plant and operations. You know, this this is just basically going uh, talking about how plants are manned and uh, you know larger larger plants. I'm sure Dale can say uh, his are manned all the time. His his large plants. Um, operators are there. There's people always on staff at the plant all the time, um, looking at potential problems, monitoring the plant, make sure everything's working well. So larger plants are manned all the time. And um, these, again, as I mentioned before, are continuously monitored by, for vibration programs locally. Um, they'll have some sort of machinery protection system that, that could provide shutdown if so needed of the turbine. Um, and they can see all of the data in that system as well. 
small hydro plants, in my experience and years of visiting them, um, are, are typically unmanned. They're in the middle of nowhere, uh, and they're remotely started and stopped from a control room that could be, you know, an hour or two away from the from the plant itself. Um, they they don't um, they don't go out there daily. They go out there probably it depends on who it is, you know, once a week or even once a month if there's no problems just to see how everything's working, everything's okay. Um, online and remote vibration monitoring are crucial for this um, so that the plant knows something's happening so they can shut that down. It's not one of those situations where they can hear something going wrong and, and shut the, the turbine down. They actually have to, they, they use the online system so that the central uh, control station, they see that they see the issue and can, can take action at that point and send somebody down there if they need to. Again, vibration monitoring is very crucial for hydro turbines. Um, it's probably, in, in my opinion, and others can speak differently, it's the most crucial measurement uh, for hydros to make sure that they they don't crash and, and something happens and could be very catastrophic. You know, we offer uh, at PCB um, what I call budget friendly solution budget friendly solutions for vibration monitoring. Of hydro plants so we've got a lot of products um, that can just about fit any budget for protection of a hydro turbine from crashing so how do how do uh, hydro plants monitor vibration and you know it's it's a lot of a lot of different ways and all this could be a larger plant might do all these things um, or some of them you know depends on um, Portable vibration data collectors is, is a very common method of monitoring vibration, not just in hydro, but any, any type of industry today. Um, I've seen plants use these, I call them vibration pen type of device. So basically it's got a tip, you lay it on a bearing of a machine and you, it'll give you an overall vibration number. It could be in, in inches per second. It could be in acceleration, Gs, or even in mils. Uh, so it'll tell a vibration and then, you know, operator or somebody will write that down what it is and they can trend it in Excel or some other type of program where they enter this information in. Vibration pans were a lot of really popular probably in the early 2000s um, or so. Uh, and, and I worked for a company then that sold three or 4,000 of those a year. Um, transmitter devices kind of came in. Um, you know, about the same time and their use quite commonly in hydro and other industries where it's a vibration sensor or a sensor and transmitter in one device is hooked up now permanently mounted to a machine bearing and a 4 to 20 uh, signal is sent out to a PLC where they monitor overall vibration. Um, and that can get, it could be in acceleration or inches per second velocity. You know, it's a lot of different output mills again. Um, Vibration switches, um, and I've, I've sold some vibration switches. Um, these are just can be very crude, you know, two hundred dollar parts that are just a big heavy box mounted on a bearing of a machine, or actually on a machine or nearby the machine. And when they sense a little bit of vibration, they they have a relay internally that uh, can just shut the machine off or sh provide an output of some sort to tell operators or somebody that need to give attention to the unit that's causing a high vibration. The switches can be set to um, to, to reset themselves or switch and then they have to be manually reset. So, you know, PCB, we've got mechanical switches that are real prudent and expensive. We've got electronic switches that, that have more smarts within them and they can also, then they can't provide a 4 to 20 output and they have electronic relays or mechanical relays and those. And we have smart switches as well that are basically the size of a standard accelerometer that you can mount on the machine. And it's just a two wire loop power device. Um, and it, there's a lot of parameters you can, you can uh, program into that sensor, um, time delays and so on. Online, vib online vibration monitoring systems, you know, and I can speak to the vendors because we, we're partners with all of them, Bentley Nevada, Vibra System, um, vibrometer, uh, all those type of guys have full-blown online vibration monitoring systems. They do air gap as well. 
um, but we, we, we typically will provide them standard accel accelerometers or velocity sensors to complement their systems. Um, uh, you know, I've seen plants, you don't hear about this too much anymore, but, you know, guys in the old days used to monitor vibration by laying a screwdriver tip on a bearing and then stick their ear up to the, the, the handle of the screwdriver. And they could tell if it was sounded any different from the last time they were there, and they could tell if the bearing's getting dry or you know if it vibrating through that method. I honestly never have done that myself, but yeah, you know, I've heard a lot of people have done that. Um, and another way that uh, plants are monitored is somebody walks out there and says something feels different. I don't think I felt that before, so that then they'll take action based on that sometimes. Um, and then lastly. Um, there's still a lot of plants out there that don't monitor vibration um, and they don't, they never have, they're not interested until they have a catastrophic event where the turbine falls apart because of vibration. And then they start thinking about vibration monitoring. Um, I'd say out of the, that percentage that have a big failure that didn't have any type of monitoring, they, they tend to get excited and they want to get a bunch of vibration monitoring installed on, on everything. And then, you know, there's half of them that just once their units put back together and running again, they kind of forget about it and they don't they don't take any other actions where others other 50% do. Uh, monitoring locations uh, typically, you know, is is the turbine guide bearings, um, the, the turbine case, um, stator bar vibration, uh, wicket gate vibration. The draft tube, a head cover, you know, looking at cavitation uh, detection there. Uh, the penstocks are um, becoming more and more common. Uh, the measure they measure the dynamic and or static pressure in the penstock to make sure that the the feed into the turbine is the right feed, so there's not going to be a lot of a lot of vibration when that water enters the turbine. Uh, just a slide showing our getting into our budget friendly solutions and what we have to offer uh, monitoring points that we're going to talk about in the upcoming slides. Uh, turbine guide bearings. So, you know, we these are what I would say um, is what we're looking at, what we typically would recommend a, a customer will come to us and say, I don't have any vibration monitoring on my on my hydro turbine. What do you suggest? So, you know, we'll sit down and we'll say, well, what do you want to monitor? So, Usually, the turbine guide bearings is the most common thing they want to monitor first. Um, and you're looking for misalignment, load zone issues, lubrication issues, you know, of course, bearing problems, imbalance. Um, so, we've got different types of products for that can look at all that, you know, low frequency accelerometers, we've got um, bearing fault detectors, and um, triaxial sensors. A lot of people are starting to use triaxial sensors uh, to get. Um, three axis of vibration with one sensor which is, is pretty pretty neat to do that um, and then we use transmitters to be able to interpret that data and feed it back into a, a plc oops sorry about that i don't know what happened it keeps jumping out for some reason let's just click Sorry about that. Um, turbine casing vibration is, you know, typically always monitored as well. And when we when we um, are looking at a real small unit that that we want to start doing some sort of low cost monitoring, we'll install a vibration switch on the turbine casing. And these are, like you can see the pictures there on the lower left. That's what our typical switches look like. The one on the left is a mechanical switch, and on the right is an electronic switch. And these are these are used to to look at structural problems. Um, temperature cycles can cause the casing to have issues going up and down all the time. The metal gets weak, and these can also be used for internal uh, damage. Um, <clears throat> that the the two switches on the right are our are, are vibration uh, smart switch we call it, which I talked about a few minutes ago. And the, these are, can be 
mounted on the, on the turbine case as well and provide an output into 4020 and also provide relay out to turn on a light, ring a bell, or shut down the, the unit. Um, turbine casing as well, sometimes we'll use um, seismic sensors, which we have um, on another side of the company, not, not within IMI, but within the PCB actual products, we have seismic sensors that can be used for looking for seismic, seismic actual movements in, in the vibration. Uh, looking at stator bar and frame vibration, you know, we're looking at, you know, unbalanced rotors, looseness in those, possible insulation. And we have uh, other sensors for this, looking low frequency excels with transmitter. And we also have what we call um, a rotating machinery protector or RMP for short. And what that's doing, uh, that would look um, mainly at component looseness. So that would, it's typically uh, there all the time providing a four to 20 milliamp output um, on overall vibration. And then it's got um, a little, uh, filter inside that if something starts, I want to say, clattering inside that maybe is component looseness, it's going to see that um, and send a send a higher 4 to 20 output to let you know something's going on inside that um, stator bar, like a, a bar's loose battling, it's going to see that where a normal vibration sensor is probably not going to see that. Uh, sometimes it will, but typically it won't. And this, this uh, RMP device is going to see it a lot sooner. Wicked gate vibration um, and position, you know, cavitation problems cause issues there, hydraulic imbalance. Um, I think uh, water damage and corrosion is one of the one of the big problem with wicked gates. Um, and of course, a misalignment, maybe something gets caught inside. So, you know, we have a, a couple accelerometers that can look at the vibration part, um, and these are underwater uh, accelerometers as well. So they can be mounted down at the gate. Um, they're really small in size and capable back out to a device to monitor the vibration. And then we've also got, through our sister company, Temposonics, a position sensor that could actually, and it, it can be mounted underwater as well to look at, um, the position of the wicket gate to make sure that it's open and closing and providing that feedback back of the position of the of the wicket gate. Graph tube and head cover vibration, you know, you know, failures there, cavitation, metal problems, hydraulics, um, especially uh, debris going through the turbine will always cause a high vibration there. Um, and we would suggest using our, um, our VO accelerometers, which are velocity output, so they can see that debris going through there and provide feedback in a velocity um, output. And those are two different uh, styles of sensors you can see in the pictures. One's a straight sensor and one's a right-angled sensor based on um, what might be needed. And then uh, we would uh, suggest that you run these into a, a vibration transmitter and go out to your PLC uh, from that point. Cavitation and vortexing. Um, so when you get water, water bubbles in the fluid flow or lack of flow, or low pressure from the penstock, you're going to have cavitation and, and or vortexing uh, problems with your with your unit. And um, we 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 have solutions and sensors. We have um, various uh, pressure sensors that can detect that. And, and these uh, these sensors can also be run into a uh, four to twenty device for monitoring the pressure, um, or or into your um, online vibration monitoring system if you have that. Uh, we also would recommend a seismic sensor that's going to really detect these uh, these uh, issues as well in that um, uh, that problem with the with cavitation. So, so that's kind of the overview of our products um, on what they are and what they do. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Dale now. He's going to talk about a little case study um, that, that Grant County did. Um, and this is using uh, using proximity probes, but it's a, it's a really good study. So, Dale? 
Okay, thank you. Just a quick reminder, put your questions in the chat. Uh, we're gonna be uh, in question Q&A here fairly soon. So uh, quick uh, two case studies, these happened pretty recently at Grant County and was a good reminder on the importance of uh, even just basic vibration equipment. These are proximity probes that were used to troubleshoot uh, two problems that we had with our uh, large Kaplan units. So uh, this is just some basic information about the unit. They're roughly 128 megawatts and uh, three guide bearings. So upper and lower generator guide bearing and then a uh, turbine guide bearing. Uh, is this is a graphic showing the location of the proximity probes. So again, you see the, the uh, three uh, guide bearing locations, two on the generator, and then one uh, lower uh, near the turbine. Here's some uh, sample plots. So the uh, first event was after a new generator was installed on an existing turbine. So after the, during the uh, unit commissioning process, it was discovered very quickly that we had much higher vibration than the contract allowed. And uh, this is a plot of the upper generator guide bearing. Uh, normally it's five mils peak to peak. And uh, you can see here, we're almost double that. Um, let's go to the next slide, Dave. Lower guide generator guide bearing. Again, you see uh, roughly um, higher than that five mils peak to peak. Uh, what was a little interesting about this event is it was dynamic in nature. It uh, had periods of higher vibration and periods of lower vibration which you uh, see in this plot. Next slide. The uh, turbine guide bearing was the most interesting. Uh, it had a lot higher displacement than the other two bearings, and it was also dynamic in nature. Uh, you can see here that we had uh, almost three times the uh, typical displacement. Uh, this was our first clue on uh, which bearing was causing us problems. Next slide. So with these displacement sensors, you also get uh, orbital plots, uh, pretty typical. Uh, you can see this; uh, these two plots show uh, the periods of uh, higher displacement and lower displacement. And uh, this is the, uh, the orbits for the upper guide bearing. Next slide. Yeah. And uh, again, orbital plots. Let's go to the next slide, Dave. The uh, turbine guide bearing, again, proved to be the most interesting. Uh, this is showing the, the two periods of uh, lower displacement versus uh, higher displacement. Uh, caused us a little bit of, uh, this is the final orbital plot. No, go ahead, yep. So the final orbital plot shows the, the overall movement of that turbine guide bearing, and again, was also the, the clue on uh, where our trouble was. Uh, what we found on this unit is that the turbine guide bearing was set too loose, and uh, that was done by internal maintenance staff and I'll talk a little bit more about that after we cover the second case study. But uh, this one was, a, it took us a little bit to troubleshoot it. We actually checked the turbine guide bearing and uh, it was determined it was uh, set correctly. And uh, unfortunately, our work procedures uh, caused uh, some misunderstanding uh, with our maintenance staff and it uh, turned out that uh, the turbine guide bearing was the problem and uh, it was not set correctly. So after uh, adjusting the turbine guide bearing to where it was supposed to be, uh, the problem went away. Let's go to the next one. 
So these plots are again displacement. Uh, this occurred after a overhaul where the unit was taken down and uh, this about every four years maintenance was done. And after the unit was restored, we had high bearing temperatures on the lower guide bearing. And that prompted us to look at the vibration data. Um, we have been guilty of the uh, approach to put in vibration equipment and forget about it. So I uh, put it in during new unit commissioning and uh, not uh, necessarily be super active in looking at it. So this is an example of uh, a reminder that uh, this information is extremely helpful after uh, you know performing something. So what we were able to gather is the uh, before and after. So before the unit was overhauled, uh, we had very low displacement. After the unit was overhauled, much higher displacement. Next slide. Uh, same here with the orbital plots. You see a before and after an overhaul. The after is the uh, smaller diameter uh, circle or orbit. And the, oh, the one on the left is uh, before the overhaul. So this was uh, a first sign of uh, we did something wrong <laughs> during the overhaul. And that's shown by the, the before and after uh, information. Uh, next slide. I think that was your last slide. Oh, Dale. that's the last slide, sorry. So in, yep. in summary with the second event, what we found is that lower generator guide bearing was set too tight. Uh, and you can see that with the orbital plots, the uh, clearances were set incorrectly. Um, the lesson learned on both of these events for us is the maintenance staff performing this work relied a lot on tribal knowledge. And we had a uh, fairly significant staff change with uh, turnover and our work instructions were just not specific enough for setting the bearings. So uh, we had two incidents uh, fairly close together where we had bearings not get set correctly. The positive part about all of this is we were able to catch these problems early and no bearing damage occurred. So because we caught it early, uh, we were able to make the required adjustments, fix the problem, and not do any repair work to the unit. So no Babbitt damage, no uh, no bearing damage, no blade strikes. Uh, so definitely a business case for the benefits of uh, vibration equipment. This could have been uh, very catastrophic for us and very costly for us if uh, it was not caught early. Cool. Oh, good stuff, Dale. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely a, a good case to show, you know, if you didn't have any type of vibration monitoring equipment, you know, it could have been very catastrophic and very expensive for, for you guys to do a repair afterwards. So, hey, Dale, do you guys use uh, uh, regular sensors for some things? Like, uh, yeah, we, I mean, not regular sense, I would say accelerometers or velocity sensors. Um, yeah, no, that's a great, great question. We do use accelerometers as well. Uh, we use accelerometers to troubleshoot an oil head problem in our Kaplan units. And uh, we've used them to uh, temporarily install to troubleshoot problems. Uh, that oil head uh, challenge, it, it was a, for a new unit and uh, it was a head scratcher. It uh, took us quite a while to find what was causing that oil head vibration and the triaxial accelerometers provided great data for us to isolate the problem. Uh, we used the accelerometers in combination with displacement probes to really hone in on uh, where the the uh, trouble piece of equipment was coming from. And uh, we've used accelerometers on commissioning units as well. Uh, so this would be new generator, new turbine to uh, you know monitor uh, 
vibration or acceleration at specific points to uh, make sure our new units are performing as we expect. Cool, good stuff. So uh, appreciate it, Dale, a lot. Uh, thank you. We're going to jump into the question and answer section of it. I got one more uh, slide I want to just show. Um, we, we talked a little bit earlier about other products that, that we have within, I want to say within P PCB. And, you know, these are, these are our sister companies and Acumetrics does some generator uh, monitoring products ground and ground fault products. Um, the mobile shop will do calibration um, products. So they're with, with their products, we're able to test proximity probes and accelerometers. You can, they do on, on site or in their, in their shop calibrations of sensors. You mail to them on this one. They can come on site and do calibrations. Uh, of course, IMI is, is part of us and part of me. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm part of IMI sensors within PCB. Um, Teposonics does uh, the position side of our business. Um, and then, of course, PCBs. Um, with that, let's, uh, we're running a little behind. Let's get into the questions. Hi, Dave. This is Elizabeth. Hey. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate oh. that. And we do have some yeah. questions. Um, quite a few from the audience, to be honest with you. So we'll just get to as many as we can get to in the time that we have. And I will throw the first question out you guys and this is somebody who's asking if you can explain the difference between accelerometers and proximity probes sure um a proximity probe is is typically mounted through a bearing housing and is it is pointed at a shaft so it's 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 mounted maybe uh eight to ten mils from the shaft and so it's it's kind of a coil wrapped or a copper wrapped um, tip uh, with with a cover, protective covering over it, and it's looking at the shaft move in relation to where the tip is. So it's it's looking at that and it's it's reading the vibration based on the movement of the shaft. Whereas an accelerometer is is mounted on a surface, you know, it might be instead of going through the bearing housing, it's going to be mounted outside of the bearing housing. So there is a there's a you know, without getting too detailed, there's a crystal inside that that is gets excited when vibration is happening, and you know, a standard accelerometer will send out a voltage signal uh, based on on the crystal's excitation inside, and and the voltage changes depending on the vibration and the setup of the sensor and the design of the sensor. So you know, kind of accelerometers are easy to easy to mount. They can be magnetically mounted, or they can be mounted with, with uh, epoxies or stud mounts on a machine permanently. Um, and you don't have to drill and tap bearing housing to get it. Um, but like I think I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the actual proximity probes is, especially for large sleeve, sleeve bearings is, is the way to monitor vibration uh, proper, properly. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, the next question says, this one's a little bit long, that I work with rotating machinery, pumps, gearbox, conveyors, fans, et cetera. We monitor bearings only, not casing and piping. That is considered, quote, useless data for this type of machinery. Why is it important, or how is it helpful and predictive in hydro to monitor piping and casing? Well, uh, hey, Dale, you want to take that? Or? Yeah, sure. Um, like a lot of things in monitoring, uh, it's not a problem till it's a problem. Um, so uh, I'll give maybe one example. Uh, we installed a large diameter uh, pipe system and uh, we had flow induced vibration. Um, certainly wasn't anticipated. And uh, that would be an example of uh, where data collection is helpful to be able to resolve that problem. So being predictive, uh, I could see how um, it may be hard to make that decision if a piece of equipment is running well and you have a lot of experience with it running well. Uh, certainly, you know, bearings is the most common application, uh, but I have seen vibration equipment used in uh, certainly piping uh, that is not performing and uh, 
you know, it usually starts with uh, noise and, and uh, you know, things yes. like that that uh, cause a lot of concern and worry and, and usually result in some troubleshooting to be able to resolve that. But uh, certainly being predictive is obviously better than reactionary. So uh, um, a, a lot is, uh, you know, being able to justify these when you don't have a problem. Uh, and then obviously it's really easy to justify when you do have a problem. Yeah, definitely, for sure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So then uh, next question we have from our uh, audience is what kind of calibration or maintenance tools are required to determine that sensors are working properly? Oh, cool. That's a that's a great question. And, you know, our, our um, sister company, the Modal Shop, has a device called a portable vibration calibrator. And they put that up on this on the screen of what that is. Uh, so, you know, this 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 is what can be used. It's portable device. It's battery powered. Um, you can mount an accelerometer on there, or with a adapter kit, uh, you can mount a proximity probe onto this. And you can we don't we can't say we can calibrate them, but we can test them to make sure that they actually are working properly. The sensors. Um, we we sold a lot of these. There's a lot of them in the hydro world. We also have a low frequency model of this uh, as well that uh, can do that. And this also you can use this to check your cabling back maybe from the sensor into your monitoring system. You can use it to even test your monitoring system to make sure it's working pr properly. So this is what we would recommend for maintenance of sensors on the field. So we can test all of our devices that we sell and, and other ones as well. Okay. Uh, another audience member asked if your company has a distributor in Chile. You betcha, we do. And uh, if we later on, if we get your information, I can send you the Chile uh, distributor, who that is. Okay. Um, another question from the audience is how do you measure cavitation? Because they are facing cavitation problems with the, it says below the Kaplan turbine. Dale, you want to want to take that one? Yeah, I think you you covered it um, briefly in, in the slide. Uh, so, you know, cavitation monitoring is is tricky. Uh, it's it I would say it's not as straightforward as you, you know bearing. Um, you know, certainly accelerometers are and pressure sensors are uh, typically used for that. Uh, to try and predict uh, cavitation. There's a lot of interest in this area. And uh, so I'm, I'm certainly not an expert in it, but I know that other utilities are doing that and uh, have shared that information. Um, and certainly Dave gave some, some examples of some instrumentation that's used for that, so. Sure. Cool, thank you, Dale. Okay. Here's another question from our audience, and they asked, does sleeve bearing mean the shaft journal bearing? Yes, uh, it's the same. Uh, there's a lot of different you know, terms for that, a journal bearing, a sleeve bearing. Um, and there's a few others. I can't think of them off the top of my head, but yeah, it's, it's the same, um, the same type of bearing, for sure. Okay, great. And I think this may be the last question we have time for. Um, this is another question from the audience asking, would some AI technology be an element in an online monitoring system? But I think by that, that question, you're, you're asking about uh, maybe an expert system. I think that's what that means. Um, and the question is, would it be an element? Um, it depends on the plan and what they want to do. If they've got experts in-house, they might uh, not need that. Um, if they don't, they would. I, I've seen a lot of expert systems over the years, and, and they're only as smart as the information you put in there. So, if you got got good information already, then maybe you don't need the expert system. But Dale, do you have any comments on that at all? Yeah, we certainly don't don't use AI in this. Uh, there's a lot of interest in certainly um, trying to better use the data that you're collecting. Uh, and uh, but but yeah, it's. Uh, it's an area of interest. Um, I would say that uh, there isn't strong interest right now, but uh, certainly it's a growth area to uh, be, you know, more predictive. 
yeah, it's been a topic in my entire career in vibration, uh, an expert system. And you know, like I said, it's it's only as good as the information that you put in, and, and only you know, you know, that you're the experts in the plant. And so a lot of people see it as not necessary, but you know, that that could be something that's going to be real important someday. So. Okay. Well, do you have anything cool. that you want? Any concluding remarks you want to make before I wrap this up, Dave or Dale? I, I think I'm good for now. Great. Well, thank you so much. It was a great presentation. We really appreciate you for sharing your expertise. Uh, we appreciate the audience that joined us to learn more about this very interesting topic. And thank you to PCB Piezotronics for sponsoring this webcast. Remember, this webcast was recorded and it will be archived on HydroView website if you want to view it again or share it with a colleague. It should be available 24 hours after this webcast concludes. So thank you and have a great rest thank of your day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Elizabeth and Dale. Take care. Bye.